UFC 292, Sterling versus O'Malley. We have a massive card taking place in Boston this weekend. We got the bantamweight belt on the line. We got a few other high profile fights to go over here. I'm gonna break down each of them, give my predictions for each fight, and let's get right into it. We're going to some women's flyweights first. We got Karina Silva taking on Marina Moros. Uh, Silva is on a six fight submission streak here. Marina Moros, she's three and two in her last five fights. This is gonna be a big grappler versus grappler matchup. Uh, we know Karina Silva's got sick jujitsu. Marina Moroza, Moroza is, uh, Moroz is no slouch either in the grappling department, but when it comes to these pure grappler versus grappler matchups, uh, you know, just go with the person the stronger the two, the better grappler. So I think that's gonna be Karina Silva. She just came off a fight where she ripped Kathleen Souza's knee apart, hard to watch, but she's bringing that violence. Um, and I think that's gonna intimidate Marina Moros as well, knowing that this, this girl can hurt me. So I'm liking Silva by submission in this first fight. Next up is Two more flyaways. We got Andrea Lee taking on Natalia Silva. Andrea Lee is going to be the big underdog in this one, uh, with An Natalia Silva being about a three to one favorite, a little more. Um, Silva is super dangerous on the feet. She is three and zero in the UFC and has gotten a few finishes uh, in her short time in the UFC. Some devastating KOs. She had a spinning heel heel kick to the face, I don't even know what you would call that, but just like a highlight reel video game knockout. I think people don't talk about that enough. Andrea Lee, on the other hand, she's never even gotten a KO in her time in the UFC, which has been extensive. She's got a few fights under her belt in the organization. I think that power difference is gonna be a big problem. Uh, Andrea Lee just isn't gonna have enough juice to throw back at Silva to get her off of her. Uh, so I think Natalia Silva finds a KO in this one as well. Uh, that power difference is just going to be too much to overcome for Andrew Lee. Next up is a middleweight fight between Andre Petrovsky and Gerald Merchart. Petrovsky is the 2-1 to one favorite in this one, uh, with Gerald Merchart being a plus 200 dog. Petrovsky is coming into this fight as 4-1 in the UFC. Mirshard is 3-2 in his last five fights. Uh, Petrovsky is a really well-rounded guy. He's got four KOs, four submissions. Um, only, I believe, one or two decision wins in his career, so he's definitely a finisher. His stand-up isn't the most polished, but I think his athleticism is the big difference maker here. He's a lot younger than Gerald Mirshard. Mirshard's got a bunch of fight miles on him he's got like at least 40 pro fights um and i think petrovsky will be able to rely on that athleticism quickness power and will find a finish versus gerald mirshart here uh probably a 50 50 shot whether it's a sub or a ko i mean i think mirshart does have really good grappling and if this turns into a pure grappling match that could be trouble but yeah petrovsky's ability on the feet and just to do damage with his hands is going to be the difference maker. He'll find a finish here. Next is a bantamweight fight. The first of the tough fights on this card. We have Brad Katona taking on Cody Gibson in the bantamweight division. These two guys have a little history. Uh, if you all watched The Ultimate Fighter, which doesn't seem like many people did. It was not very talked about. It was kind of just 10 minutes of Connor saying egregious stuff and the rest of the episodes were not very entertaining outside of the fights. Uh, but yeah, they were beefing a little bit. It was probably the most high profile, uh, you know, problem, uh, beef between any of the fighters on the show. Cody Gibson called Katona out for being just a grappler, boring ass fighter, which I heavily agree with. Uh, between these two guys, Katona had the more recent UFC uh, tenure. He won tough a uh, previous tough season and last participated in the UFC in 2019. Cody Gibson hasn't been in the UFC since 2015, but he has had his fair share of fights since the UFC in some other uh, 
bigger promotions. Gibson's really long. He's really tough to grab a hold of, and I think he has good grappling. Uh, and good enough grappling just to deter Katona and not allow Katona to just hold on to him for the whole fight, which is probably going to be Katona's uh, strategy in this one. I'm liking Gibson by decision here. Katona is going to be going to be the first fighter to ever win the Ultimate Fighter twice, but I think Gibson is going to prevent him from doing that. And then the lightweight Ultimate Fighter finale is taking place between Austin Hubbard and Kurt Holbaugh. Austin Hubbard is the minus 170 favorite in this one. And his most recent fight on Tough was basically just a glorified sparring match with Roosevelt Roberts. The two were boys, and you could tell that they just did not want to fight each other. Um, kind of unfortunate. Dana uh, ended up calling him out on it a little bit, but... Hoba, on the other hand, absolutely went to war versus Jason Knight. Um, pommeled Jason Knight, showed off brilliant striking. Uh, but I think Hubbard is the more polished of these two guys. Hubbard's long. He's got really good striking. And I think he's just going to have the, the cleaner jab between these two guys, cleaner combinations. We saw Hoba in the UFC. He went 0-4. Never won in the UFC once. Hubbard, on the other hand, he went three and four, which isn't great at all, but at least Hubbard's kind of shown that he can co compete against UFC talent, and we really just haven't seen Hall about prove that. So I think Hubbard gets a decision win in that one. Next up is a middleweight fight between Gregory Rodriguez and Dennis Tulin. Rodriguez is the minus 350 favorite in this one. He's three and two in his last five fights. Tululin is 1-2 and two in the UFC, and he's about a 3-1 underdog. Rodriguez is coming off of a pretty vicious KO to uh, Bruno Ferreira, where he got put out cold, like just unconscious on the ground. And he really got his chin and lack of defense exposed. He's had a tendency to just kind of flail strikes, and it works when you're landing, and then it doesn't work when the other guy hits you first. But... I think this is going to be a really good matchup for Rodriguez. To to Lulin just doesn't really possess that power that I'd say most middleweights do, where you can put someone out in one punch. We just haven't really seen that out of Tululin. Um Tululin has only been KO'd once in his own right, but uh, Rodriguez is a bit of a KO artist. Um, he's only gotten one submission win, or he's only gotten a submission win in 2018, none since. He's not going to grab your neck if he gets you down. He's just going to keep punishing you. Um, I think Rodriguez finds a KO in this one. Maybe he doesn't put Tululin out, but definitely will look to get a TKO in this one. Next up are some more middleweights. It is Chris Weidman's return to the UFC after a few years, after just almost losing his leg, it looked like. He's taking on Pratt, Brad Tavares. Tavares is two and three in his last fights, as is Chris Weidman, and Tavares is going to be the favorite in this one at minus 270. What are we going to see from Brad, uh, from Chris Weidman? I really have no idea. Supposedly, he had to learn how to walk after that devastating leg injury. Uh, that's something you never really want to hear especially if your job is to go and fight in a cage after that. We saw Anderson Silva suffer a similar leg injury versus Chris Weidman and never really was the same. This just seems like a tough one to bet Weidman on. I mean, if all else was equal and Weidman was the guy he used to be, I mean, this would be no question, the former champ, but Tavares is... 35 years old, but he hasn't really shown his age nearly as much. Um, Wyman, you know he's going to try and grapple, and I think that's just got to be tough with a leg injury. It's so hard to train grappling like that if you can't walk for so long. So I think Tavares wins this one by decision. Uh, of course, Chris Wyman can come out and just stun, stun everyone and... Um, 
be able to take Tavares down and just sort of ride him out for the whole fight, but I just don't anticipate him being able to do that after such a devastating injury at his age. So Tavares by decision is the pick. Our first card of the main event is a bantamweight fight between Cheeto Vera and Pedro Munoz. Cheeto is the minus 200 favorite in this one, with Pedro being plus 170 or so. Cheeto's 4-1 in his last five. Of course, he's coming off of that loss to Corey Sanhagen. Corey really just outclassed him that entire fight. Uh, he won the striking exchanges and basically took down Cheeto at will. Uh, it was definitely, I think, a wake-up call for Cheeto where he can't really rely on these slow starts like he did versus Dominic Cruz where he found a KO in that fight or even versus Rob Font where his output just is far less than his opponent and then he just sort of relies on coming on late. I think he learned that, you know, sometimes if you just wait and wait and wait, your, your time may never come. So I'm expecting Cheeto to be a lot more aggressive here, but he's taking on... Pedro Munoz, who's coming off of a huge win versus Chris Gutierrez, a guy who uh, was a heavy favorite in that fight versus Munoz, but Munoz sort of proved that he belongs to stay in the top 15 among the elite of the Bantamweights. Pedro's a shorter guy, but he's got great striking, great footwork, and he's quick and hits hard. He sat down Gutierrez in their last fight. Uh, I think Cheeto, we're going to see a new Cheeto in this fight. I think he's going to really use his length over Pedro Munoz and get active earlier in the fight. Is he going to come out absolutely guns blazing? No, that's just not who he is. But I think he's going to put the pace on Pedro Munoz and really look to uh, excel in the latter parts of these rounds. He may get outstruck, but I think he'll land the bigger shots, the more powerful shots try and sit down Pedro Munoz a couple times to just be able to win the fight on the cards. Munoz doesn't get knocked out though, so that is why Cheeto by decision is gonna be the pick here. Next on the main event, uh, the main card, we have Damon Blackshear taking on Mario Bautista. Damon Blackshear is three one and one in his last five and is coming in at a plus 180 underdog. Batista, on the other hand, is going to be the minus 225 favorite here. And he's on a four-fight win streak in the UFC. Blackshear, if uh, if his name's sounding super familiar, he just got a first-round twi twister submission win in last weekend's card. He's back. He's replacing Cody Garbrandt, taking on Mario Batista. Uh, probably a good thing. I think Cody would have gotten eaten alive by Batista. Just a bad matchup for Cody, and I think Cody should be fighting bigger names than Mario Batista, quite frankly. Batista's guy who's on a three-fight submission streak, um, has really sick jiu-jitsu, is putting out guys like Guido Canetti, and uh, uh, who else did he submit? Oh, Lopez, Brian Kelleher. So he's got three big submission wins here. Um, he's super quick, super strong. But Damon Blackshear is a guy with really strong grappling in his own right. He's, uh, I mean, you look at the guy and he's just like a really built. You can tell he's super strong and he's coming off of a win in his second most recent fight against another 12 and two submission guy, Luan Lacerda. So I think he does it again here. Mario Batista, also 12 and two, also a guy who relies on submissions. I think Blackshear is going to surprise a lot of people with his grappling. I think that's always been his strong suit. Pretty good striking in the clinch. Um, but yeah, I think he'll be able to just win the grappling exchanges, control Batista on the ground, and win this one by decision. If Mario Batista comes out here, though, and finishes Demon Blackshear, that dude could definitely be a problem in the bandweight division, though. Uh, next up is a welterweight fight. We got Ian Gary taking on Neil Magny. Not much to really say in this one. Ian Gary's the minus almost 500 favorite. He's proved a lot in his last two fights. He had that fight versus Song Kanan where he got hit. Probably the hardest he ever been, has been in his career. Hit the deck, you could tell he was wobbled, but then he came back and scored his own 
super flashy KO versus Song. Um, so proving that he can overcome adversity there. And then after that, he came out against D-Rod, uh, a guy who's got pretty solid striking. Um, certainly a, a big test for a prospect like Ian Gary, and he handled his business, put him out in the first round. Neil Magny is going to be the best grappler Ian Gary fa ever faced, and Magny's coming in with just so much experience, so savvy. He knows what it takes to win a fight, and he's good at imposing his game plan, which is stuffing you up on the cage and uh, just sort of pummeling you with, in the clinch and trying to control you on the ground. But I don't think that's going to deter Ian Gary. Uh, Ian Gary was preparing for... Jeff Neal, who is a far more dangerous fighter than Neil Magny. Um, so he's not really gonna have to worry about getting caught nearly as much in this fight as he would before. That KO threat is just not really gonna be posed here by Magny. I think Ian Gary runs through him, KOs him, I'd say in the second round. Right, no, let's go second round submission. I think uh, Ian Gary had actually said something like that, where he was gonna find his neck in the second round. I like him calling his shots. Ian Gary by second round submission is going to be the pick here. Uh, yeah, that was a very last minute decision, but my gut's telling me sub here, and you got to trust your gut sometimes. But yeah, Ian Gary, this dude is, I was a, a bit of a, a self-admitted, I'll say skeptic, I'm not going to say hater, but man, he's, he's proving people wrong every time he goes out there. And with the win here, uh, we could be looking at a top 10, top 5 matchup for Ian Gary. Our co-main event is going to be a strawweight fight between Zhang Wei Li and Amanda Lemos. Uh, Zhang Wei Li is coming in at minus 350, with Lemos being a plus 260 underdog. I think this is a really intriguing matchup for Wei Li because Lemos is... A remarkable finisher. She's got 13 wins, only two of them coming by decision, all others by KO or, or sub. Um, Lamos is really, really strong on the feet. Uh, she's got powerful hands. May, might, might be the heaviest hitter in the strawweight division. Um, at least just when it comes to her hands. And we have seen Jang Wei Li get put out before albeit it was a head kick from Rose Namajunas. But, so that that is gonna be something that Jamie Lee will be cautious of. She's gonna know that Lamos is gonna try and just uh, beat her on the feet, but Wei Li's no slouch on the feet herself. She's got her own arsenal of spinning back fists and kicks and really strong right hands. We saw her put away Ioana, uh in, in her second most recent fight and then completely dominate Carla Sparza. I think Zhang Wei Li is the best female fighter alive probably now that <clears throat> Nunez is retired. Lambos just doesn't have the big fight experience here and has really only been performing against, uh, let's just say the not the most elite of the women's strawweight division. Her win over Rodriguez was definitely impressive, but Zhang Wei Li's been doing it against former champs. And uh, yeah, we've, we've seen her just really turn the corner into becoming a just unstoppable force in the strawweight division. I think Rose Inami Yunus is really her only threat in the strawweight division. And we don't really even know what Rose is up to. Wei Li's gonna be the far stronger fighter between these two, far better grappler. I think she wins this one by submission. And our main event, you already know what it is, it's a bandweight fight between Aljamain Sterling, the human backpack, and he's taking on the sugar show, Sean O'Malley. Aljo is the minus 250 favorite here. People think he's get, gonna just climb on Sean's back and uh, it's, it's not crazy to think that. He's been doing it for nine fights in a row now. He's on a nine fight win streak. Um, he's had his fair share of ups and downs. I mean, I think it's fair to sort of take a deeper look at Aljamain Sterling's record and say, and say, okay, the TJ Dillashaw win, like you can throw an asterisk on that. 
and people are going to have a tendency to do that. Uh, but I really think he's repented for how he won the belt. Um, he's had coming off of a great win versus Henry Cejudo, which he pretty much just dominated. And now he's knocking on the door of GOAT status. A win here would be 10 in a row. And I, I yeah, I think he could surpass Dominic Cruz or whoever you have as the number one bandwidth of all time if he gets another title defense here. But man, Sean is a very dangerous matchup. When you look at the stand-up comparison between these two, I think there's just there's just absolutely no comparison. Sean's got some of the strongest hands in the division. We saw him crack Piotr Jan. I mean, it, I don't know if I would have, I definitely didn't pick O'Malley to win that fight in the moment, but on second watching or third watching of that fight, Sean proved that he's the guy that uh, he says he is. He's super dangerous. And I think his grappling is even a bit underrated. He took down Piotr Jan in their fight. Um, yes, he sometimes will grab the cage to stand up, but if the ref's not gonna get on him or take points away for it, I mean, by any means necessary, he's just gonna have to make sure to not let Aljo climb on his back. I think Aljo is a bit more one-dimensional than people give him credit for. I mean, if he's not literally on your back, legs wrapped around you, I just don't really see how dangerous he is. Um, Sean O'Malley, on the other hand, he's got a bunch of ways to beat you on the feet. I mean, he's, uh, you definitely don't want him on top of you, raining down punches. And uh, Aljamain Sterling, as much as he says, the first one to shoot for a takedown is a, is a bitch or whatever. I just, uh, I think he's gonna be only looking for the takedowns from the get-go. He's gonna be one-dimensional. And I think Sean wins this fight by KO. I really do. I think this is the start of the Sugar Show. Sean bet on himself versus Piotr Jan most recently fight and it paid off. And uh, I think it pays off here as well. We're gonna see just how explosive Sean is. And he's taken off his, taken on his toughest matchup yet. I mean, this is just so quintessential classic grappler versus striker, but the fight always starts on the feet. So I'm giving the edge to O'Malley here. I think he wins this one. Uh, we're getting good value with the money line, but dang, I mean, I, I think he could definitely find a KO versus Sterling who's been KO'd before. So that's gonna be the pick. And with that, that is my breakdown of this card. Thank you so much for watching. Like, subscribe. Let me know your thoughts in the comments if you do so, please. And let's have a great weekend, fellas. Let's get after it.